Chapter 3 Dragon Tales. At dawn, the sun's rays streamed through the window, warming Aragon's face. Rubbing his eyes, he sat up on the edge of the bed. The pine floor was cold under his feet. He stretched his sore legs and rubbed his back, yawning. Beside the bed were a row of shelves covered with objects he had collected. There were twisted pieces of wood, odd bits of shells, rocks that had been broken to reveal shiny interiors, and strips of dried grass tied into knots. His favorite item was a root so convoluted he never tired of looking at it. The rest of the room was bare except for a small dresser and a nightstand. He pulled on his boots and stared at the floor thinking, this was a special day. It was near this very hour, 16 years ago, that his mother, Selina, had come to Carvajal alone and pregnant. She had been gone for six years, living in the cities. When she returned, she wore expensive clothes and her hair was bound by a net of pearls. She sought out her brother, Garrow, and asked to stay with him until the baby arrived. Within five months, her son was born. Everyone was shocked when Selina tearfully begged Garrow and Marion to raise him. When they had asked why, she only wept and said, I must. Her plea had grown increasingly desperate until they finally agreed. She named him Aragon, then departed early the next morning and never returned. Aragon still remembered how he had felt when Marion had told him the story before she died. The realization that Garrow and Marion were not his real parents had disturbed him greatly. Things that had been permanent and unquestionable were suddenly thrown into doubt. Eventually he had to learn to live with it, but he always had a nagging suspicion that he had not been good enough for his mother. I'm sure there was a good reason for what she did. I only wish I knew what it was. One other thing had bothered him. Who was his father? Selina had told no one, and whoever it might have been had never come looking for Aragon. He wished he had knew who it was, if only to have a name. It would be nice to know his heritage. He sighed and went to the nightstand, where he splashed his face, shivering as the water ran down his neck. Refreshed, he retrieved the stone from under his bed and set it on a shelf. The morning light caressed it, throwing the warm shadow on the wall. He touched it one more time, then hurried to the kitchen. Eager to see his family, Garrow and Roran were already there, eating chicken. As Aragon greeted them, Roran stood with a grin. Roran was two years older than Aragon, muscular, sturdy, and careful with his movements. They could not have been closer even if they had been real brothers. Roran smiled. I'm glad you're back. How was the trip? Hard, replied Aragon. Did Uncle tell you what happened? He replied. He helped himself to a piece of chicken, which he devoured hungrily. No! said Roran, and the story was quickly told. At Roran's insistence, Aragon left his food to show him the stone. This elicited a satisfactory amount of awe, but Roran soon asked nervously, Were you able to talk to Katrina? No, there wasn't an opportunity after this argument with Sloane, but she'll expect you when the traitors come. I gave the message to Horst. He'll get it to her. You told Horst? said Roran incredulously. That was private. If anyone were to know about it, I could have built a bonfire and used smoke signals to communicate. If Sloane finds out, he won't let me see her again. Horst will be discreet, assured Aragon. He won't let anyone fall prey to Sloane, least of all you. Roran seemed unconvinced, but argued no more. They returned to their meals in the taciturn presence of Garrow. When the last bites were finished, all three went to work on the fields. The sun was cold and pale, providing little comfort. Under its watchful eye, the last of the barley was stored in the barn. Next, they gathered prickly vine squash, then rutabaga beets, peas, turnips, and beans, which they packed into a root cellar. After hours of labor, they stretched their cramped muscles, pleased the harvest they had finished. The following days were spent pickling, salting, shelling, and preparing the food for winter. Nine days after Aragon's return, a vicious blizzard blew up the mountains and settled over the valley. The snow came down in great sheets, blanketing the countryside in white. They only dared leave the house for firewood and feed the animals, for they feared getting lost in the howling wind and featureless landscape. They spent their time huddled over the stove as gusts rattled the heavy windows. Days later, the storm finally passed, revealing an alien world of soft white drifts. I'm afraid. The traders may not come up this year with conditions this bad, said Garrow. They're late as is. We'll give them a chance and wait before going to Carvajal. But if they don't show soon, we'll have to buy spare supplies from the townspeople. His countenance was resigned. They grew anxious as the days crept by without any sign of traders. Talk was sparse, and depression hung over the house. On the eighth morning, Roran walked to the road and confirmed that the traders had not yet passed. The day was spent readying the trip into Carvajal, scrounging with grim expressions for saleable items. That evening, out of desperation, Aragon checked the road again. He found deep ruts cut into the snow with numerous hoof prints between them. Elated, he ran back to the house, whooping, bringing new life to their preparations. They packed their surplus produce into the wagon before sunrise. Garrow put the year's money in a leather pouch that he carefully fastened to his belt. Aragon set the wrapped stone between bags of grain so it would not roll when the wagon hit bumps. After the hasty breakfast, they harnessed the horses and cleared a path to the road. The traders' wagons had already broken the drifts, which sped their progress. By noon, they could see Carvajal. In daylight, it was a small, earthy village filled with shouts and laughter. The traders had made camp in an empty field on the outskirts of town. Groups of wagons, tents, and fires were randomly spread across it. 
Spots of color against the snow. The troubadours' four tents were garishly decorated. A steady stream of people linked the camp to the village. Crowds churned around the line of bright tents and booths clogging the main street. Horses whinnied at the noise. The snow had been pounded flat, giving it a glassy surface. Elsewhere, bonfires had melted it. Roasted hazelnuts added a rich aroma to the smells wafting around them. Garrow parked the wagon and pickets and the horse then drew coins from his pouch. Get yourself some treats. Roan, do what you want. I'll be at horse in time for supper, Aragon. Bring that stone and come with me. Aragon grinned at Roran and pocketed the money, already planning how to spend it. Roran departed immediately. Roran departed immediately with a determined expression on his face. Garrow led Aragon into the throng, shouldering his way through the bustle. Women were buying cloth, and nearby their husbands examined a new latch, hook, or tool. Children ran up and down the road, shrieking with incitement. Knives were displayed here, spices there, and pots were laid out in shiny rows next to the leather harnesses. Aragon stared at the traders curiously. They seemed less prosperous than last year. Their children had a frightened, wary look, and their clothes were patched. The gaunt men carried swords and daggers with new familiarity, and the women even had poniard belts at their waist. What else could have happened to make them like this? Why are they so late? Undered Aragon. He remembered the traders as being full of good cheer, but there was none of that now. Garrow pushed down the street, searching for Murloc, a trader who specialized in odd trinkets and pieces of jewelry. They found him behind a booth, displaying brooches to a group of women. As each new piece was revealed, exclamations of admiration followed. Aragon guessed that more than a few purses would soon be depleted. Murloc seemed to flourish and grow every time his wares were complimented. He wore a goatee, held himself with ease, and seemed to regard the rest of the world with slight contempt. The excited group prevented Garrow and Aragon from getting near the traitor, so they settled on a step and waited. As soon as Murloc was unoccupied, they hurried over. And what might you sirs want to look at? asked Murloc. An amulet? Or a trinket? For a lady? With a twirl, he pulled out a delicately carved silver rose of excellent workmanship. The polished metal caught Aragon's attention, and he eyed it appreciatively. The traitor continued. Not even three crowns, though it has come all the way from the famed craftsman of Bellatona. Garrow spoke in a quiet voice. We aren't looking to buy, but sell. Murloc immediately covered the rose and looked at them with new interest. I see. Maybe, if this item is of worth any value, then you would like to trade it for one or two of these exquisite pieces. He paused for a moment while Aragon and his uncle stood uncomfortably, then continued. You did bring the object of consideration. We have it, but I would rather show it to you elsewhere, said Garrow in a firm voice. Murloc raised an eyebrow, but spoke smoothly. In that case, let me invite you to my tent. He gathered his wares and gently laid them on an iron-bound chest, which he locked. Then he ushered them up the street and into a temporary camp. They wound between wagons to a tent removed from the rest of the traders. It was crimson at the top and sable at the bottom, the thin triangle colors stabbing into each other. Murloc untied the opening and swung the flap to one side. Small trinkets and strange pieces of furniture, such as a round bed and three seats carved from a tree stumps, filled the tent. A gnarled dagger with a ruby and the pommel rested on a white cushion. Murloc closed the flap and turned to them. Please, seat yourselves. When they had, he said, Now, show me why we are meeting in private. Aragon unwrapped the stone and set it between the two men. Murloc reached for it with a gleam in his eye, then stopped and asked, May I? When Garrow indicated the approval, Murloc picked it up. He put the stone on his lap and reached to one side for a thin box. Opened... It revealed the large set of copper scales, which he set on the ground. After weighing the stone, he scrutinized the surface under a jeweler's glass, tapped it gently with a wooden mallet, and drew the point of a tiny clear stone over it. He measured its length and diameter, then recorded the figures on a slate. He considered the results for a while. Do you know what it's worth? No, admitted Garrow. His cheek twitched and he shifted uncomfortably at the seat. Murloc grimaced. Unfortunately, neither do I. But I can tell you this much. The white veins are the same material as the blue that surrounds them, only a different color. What the material might be, though? I haven't a clue. It's harder than any rock I have ever seen. Harder than diamond. Whoever shaped this used tools I have never seen. Or magic. Also, it's hollow. What? exclaimed Garrow. An irritated edge crept into Murloc's voice. Did you ever hear a rock sound like this? He grabbed the dagger from the cushion and slapped the stone with the flat of the blade. A pure note filled the air, then faded away smoothly. Aragon was alarmed afraid that the stone had been damaged. Murloc tilted the stone toward them. You will find no scratches or blemishes where the dagger struck. I doubt I could do any harm to the stone even if I took a hammer to it. Garrow crossed his arms with a reserved expression. A wall of silence surrounded him. Aragon was puzzled. I knew that the stone had appeared in the spine through magic, but made by magic? What for and why? He blurted. But what is it worth? I can't tell you that, said Murloc in a pained voice. I'm sure that people would pray dearly to have it. But none of them are in Carvajal. You would have to go to the southern cities to find a buyer. This is a curiosity for most people, not an item to spend money on when practical things are needed. Garrow stared at the tent ceiling like a gambler calculating the odds. Will you buy it? The trader answered instantly. 
It's not worth the risk. I might be able to find a wealthy buyer during the spring travels, but I can't be certain. Even if I did, you wouldn't be paid until I return next year. No, you will have to find someone else to trade with. I am curious, however. Why did you insist on talking to me in private? Aragon put the stone away before answering. Because, he glanced at the man, wondering if he would explode like Sloan. I found this in the spine, and folks around here don't like that. Murloc gave him a startled look. Do you know why my fellow merchants and I were late this year? Aragon shook his head. Our wanderings have been dogged with misfortune. Chaos seems to rule Allegasia. We could not avoid illness, attacks, and the most cursed black luck, because the Vardens attacks have increased. Galbatorx has forced cities to send more soldiers to the borders, men who are needed to combat the Urgles. The brutes have been migrating southeast toward the Hadarak Desert. No one knows why, and it wouldn't concern us, except that they're passing through populated areas. They've spotted on roads and near cities. Worst of all, reports of a shade, though the stories are unconfirmed. Not many people survive such an encounter. Why haven't we heard of this? cried Aragon. Because, said Murloc, it's only a few months ago. Whole villages have been forced to move because Urgos destroyed their fields and starvation threatens. Nonsense. We haven't seen the Urgos. The only one around here has his horns mounted at Morn's Tavern. Murloc arched his eyebrows. Maybe so, but this is a small village hidden by the mountain. It's not surprising that you've escaped notice. However, I wouldn't expect that to last. I only mention this because strange things are happening here as well if you found such a stone in the spine. With that statement, he bid them farewell with a bow and slight smile. Garrow headed back to Carvajal with Aragon trailing behind him. What do you think? Asked Aragon. I'm going to get more information before I make up my mind. Take the stone back to the wagon, then do what you want. I'll meet you for dinner at Holst's. Aragon dodged through the crowd and happily dashed back to the wagon. Trading would take his uncle hours, time that he had planned to enjoy fully. He hid the stone under the bags, then set out to town with a cocky stride. He walked from one booth to another, evaluating the goods with a buyer's eye. Despite his meager supply of coins, when he talked with the merchants, they confirmed what Murloc had said about the instability in Allegasia. Over and over, the message was repeated. Last year's security has deserted us. New dangers have appeared, and nothing is safe. Later in the day, he bought three sticks, a malt of candy, and a small, piping hot cherry pie. The hot food felt good after hours of standing in the snow. He licked the sticky syrup from his fingers, regretfully wishing for more, then sat at the edge of the porch and nibbled a piece of candy. Two boys from Carvajal wrestled nearby, but he felt no inclination to join them. As the day descended into late afternoon, the traders took their business into people's homes. Aragon was impatient for evening when the troubadours would come out and tell stories and perform tricks. He loved hearing about magic, gods, and was especially lucky, the dragon riders. Carvajal had its own storyteller, Brom, a friend of Aragon, but the tales had grew old over the years, whereas the troubadours always had new ones that he listened to eagerly. Aragon had just broken off an icicle from the underside of a porch when he spotted Sloane nearby. The butcher had not seen him, so Aragon ducked his head and bolted around the corner to Morn's tavern. The inside was hot and filled with a greasy smoke from sputtering tallow candles. The shiny black ergo horns, their twisted span as great as outstretched arms, were mounted over the door. The bar was long and low with a stack of staves on one end for customers to carve. Morn tended the bar, his sleeves rolled up to his elbows. The bottom half of his face was short and mashed as if he had rested his chin on a grinding wheel. People crowded solid oak tables and listened to two traders who had finished their business early and had come in for beer. Morn looked up from the mug he was cleaning. Aragon, good to see you. Where's your uncle? Fine, said Aragon with a shrug. He's gonna be a while. And Rorin, is he here? Asked Morn as he swiped the cloth through another mug. Yes, yes, no sick animals to keep him back this year. Good, good, Aragon gestured at the two traders. Who are they? Grain buyers. They bought everyone's seed at a ridiculously low prices, and now they're telling wild stories, expecting us to believe them. Aragon understood why Morn was upset. People needed that money. We can't get by without it. What kind of stories? Morn snorted. They say the Varden have formed a pact with the Urgles, and they're massing an army to attack us. Supposedly, it's only through the grace of our king that has been protected for so long, as if Galvatorix would care if we burned to the ground. Go listen to them. I have enough on my hands without explaining their lies. The first traitor filled a chair with his enormous girth. His every movement caused it to protest loudly. There was no hint of hair on his face. His pudgy hands were baby smooth, and he had pouting lips that curled petulantly as he sipped from a flagon. The second man had a florid face. The skin around his jaw was dry and corpulent filled with lumps of hard fat, like cold butter gone rancid. Contrasted with his neck and jowls, the rest of his body was unnaturally thin. The first trader vainly tried to pull back his expanding borders to fit within the chair. He said, No, you don't understand. It's the only thing the king's unceasing efforts on behalf that you are able to argue with us in safety. If he, in all his wisdom, were withdrawn support, woe unto you, someone hollered. Right, why don't you also tell us the riders have returned and you've killed a hundred elves? Do you think we're children to believe your tales? We can take care of ourselves. 
The group chuckled. The trader started to reply, then his thin compliant intervened and waved his hand, gaudy jewels on his fingers. You misunderstand. We know the Empire cannot care for each of us personally, as you may want, but it can keep the Urgul and other abominations from overrunning us. He searched vaguely for his terms. Place, traders continued. You're angry with the Empire for treating people unfairly. A legitimate concern. But a government cannot please everyone. There will inevitably be arguments and conflicts. However, the majority of us have nothing to complain about. Every country has a small group of malcontents who aren't satisfied with the balance of power. Yeah, call the woman. If you're willing to call the Varden small, the fat man sighed. We already explained the Varden will have no interest in helping you. That's only a falsehood perpetuated by the traitors in an attempt to disrupt the Empire and convince us that the real threat is inside, not outside our borders. All they want is to overthrow the king and take possession of our land. They have spies everywhere as they prepare to invade. You never know who might be working for them. Aragon did not agree, but the traitor's words were smooth and people were nodding. He stepped forward and said, How do you know this? I can say that clouds are green, but that doesn't mean it's true. Prove you aren't lying. The two men glared at him while the villagers waited silently before him. The thin trader spoke first. He avoided Aragon's eyes. Aren't your children taught respect? Or do you let boys challenge men whenever they want? The listeners fidgeted and stared at Aragon. Then a man said, Answer the question. It's only common sense, said the fat one, sweat beating on his upper lip. His reply riled the villagers. The dispute resumed. Aragon returned to the bar with a sour taste in his mouth. He had never met anyone before who favored the Empire and tore down its enemies. There was a deep-seated hatred of the Empire in Carvajal, also hereditary in nature. The Empire had never helped them during the harsh years when they nearly starved, and its tax collectors were heartless. He felt justified in agreeing with the traitors regarding the King's mercy, but he did not speculate about the Varden. The Varden were a rebel group that constantly raided and attacked the Empire. It was a mystery who their leader was, or who had formed them the years following Galbatorix's rise to power over a century ago. The group had garnered much sympathy as they eluded Galbatorix his effort to destroy them. Little was known about the Varden, except that if you were a fugitive and had to hide, or if you hated the Empire, they would accept you. The only problem was finding them. Morn leaved over the bar and said, Incredible, isn't it? They're worse than vultures circling a dying animal. There's going to be trouble if you stay much longer. For us or for them? Them, said Morn, as angry voices filled the tavern. Aragon left when the argument threatened to become violent. The door thudded shut behind him, cutting off the voices. It was early evening, and the sun was sinking rapidly. The house cast a long shadow on the ground. As Aragon headed down the street, he noticed Rorin and Katrina standing in an alley. Rorin said something Aragon could not hear. Katrina looked down at her hands and answered with in an undertone, then leaned up on her tiptoes and kissed him before darting away. Aragon trotted to Rorin and teased. Having a good time? Rorin grunted, noncommittal as he paced away. Have you heard the traitor's news? asked Aragon following. Most of the villagers were indoors, talking to traitors, waiting until it was dark enough for the troubadours to perform. Yes, Rorin seemed distracted. What do you think of Sloane? I thought it was obvious. There will be blood between us when he finds out about Katrina and me, stated Rorn. A snowflake landed on Aragon's nose, and he looked up. The sky had turned gray. He could think of nothing appropriate to say. Rorn was right. He clasped his cousin on the shoulder, and they continued down the byway. Dinner at Horst was hearty. The room was full of conversation and laughter. Sweet cordials and heavy ales were consumed in copious amounts, adding to the boisterous atmosphere. When the plates were empty, horse guests left the house and started strolling to the fields where the traders camped. A ring of poles topped with candles had been stuck on the ground around a large clearing. Bonfires blazed in the background, painting the ground with dancing shadows. The villagers slowly gathered around the circle and waited expectantly in the cold. The troubadours came tumbling out of their tents, dressed in tasseled clothing, followed by older and more stately minstrels. The minstrels provided music and narration as their younger counterparts acted out the stories. The first plays were pure entertainment, body and full of jokes, pratfalls, and ridiculous characters. Later, however, when the candles sputtered in their sockets and everyone was drawn together in a tight circle, the old storyteller Brahm stepped forward. A knotted white beard rippled over his chest, and a long black cape was wrapped around his bent shoulders, obscuring his body. He spread his arms with hands that reached out like talons and recited thus. The sands of time cannot be stopped. Years pass whether we will them or not, but we can remember. What has been lost may yet live on in memories. That which you will hear is imperfect and fragmented, yet treasure it, for without you it does not exist. I give you now a memory that has been forgotten, hidden in the dreamy haze that lies behind us. His keen eyes inspected their interested faces. His gaze lingered on Aragon last of all. Before your grandfather's fathers were born, and yea, even before their fathers, the dragon riders were formed. To protect and guard was their mission, and for thousands of years they succeeded. Their prowess in battle was unmatched, 
for they had the strength of ten men. They were immortal unless blade or poison took them. For good only were their powers used, and under their tutelage tall cities and towers were built out of living stone. While they kept peace the land flourished, it was a golden time. The elves were our allies, and the dwarves our friends. Wealth flowed into our cities and men prospered, but weep for it could not last. Brom looked down silently, infinite sadness resonated in his voice. Though no enemy could destroy them, they could not guard against themselves. And it came to pass at the height of their power that a boy, Galbatorix by name, was born in the province of Isnilbeth, which is no more. At ten he was tested, as was custom, and it was found that great power resided in him. The riders accepted him as their own. Through their training he passed, exceeding all others in skill, gifted, with a sharp mind and a strong body, he quickly took his place among the riders' ranks. Some saw his abrupt rise as dangerous and warned others, but the riders had grown arrogant in their power and ignored caution. Alas, sorrow was conceived that day. So it was soon after his training was finished, Galbatorix took a reckless trip with two friends. Far north they flew night and day, passed into Urgle territory, foolishly thinking their new power would protect them. There, on a thick sheet of ice, unmelted even in summer, they were ambushed in their sleep. Though his friends and their dragons were butchered, and he suffered great wounds, Galbatorix slew his attackers. Tragically, during the fight, a stray arrow pierced his dragon's heart. Without the arts to save her, she died in his arms. Then were the seeds of madness planted. The storyteller clasped his hands and looked around slowly, shadows flickering across his worn face. The next words came out like a mournful toll of a requiem. Alone, Bereft of much of his strength and half mad with loss, Galbatorix wandered without hope in that desolate land. Seeking death, it did not come for him. Though he threw himself without fear against any living thing, Urgles and other monsters soon fled his haunted form. During the time, he came to realize that riders might not grant him another dragon. Driven by this thought, he began the arduous journey on foot back through the spine. Territory he had soared over effortlessly on a dragon's back now took him months to traverse. He could hunt with magic, but oftentimes he walked in places where animals did not travel. Thus, when his feet finally met the mountains, he was close to death. A farmer found him collapsed in the mud and summoned the riders. Unconscious, he was taken to their holdings. His body healed. He slept for four days. Upon awakening, he gave no sign of his fevered mind. When he was brought before the council convened to judge him, Galbatorix demanded another dragon. The desperation of the request revealed his dementia, and the council saw him for what he truly was. Denied hope, Galbatorix, through twisted mirror of his madness, came to believe it was the rider's fault his dragon had died. Night after night, he brooded on that and formulated a plan to exact revenge. Brahm's word dropped into a mesmerizing whisper. He found a sympathetic rider, and there his insidious words took root. By persistent reasoning and the use of dark secrets learned from a shade, he inflamed the rider against their elders. Together, they treacherously lured and killed an elder. When they found the deed was done, Galbatorix turned on his ally and slaughtered him without warning. The riders found him. Then, with blood dripping from his hands, a scream tore from his lips, and he fled into the night. As he was cunning in his madness, they could not find him. For years, he hid in wastelands like a hunted animal, always watching for pursuers. His atrocity was not forgotten, but over time, searches ceased. Then, through some ill fortune, he met a young rider, Morzan. Strong of body, but weak of mind, Galbatorix convinced Morzan to leave the gate unbolted in the citadel Illyria, which was now called Urubane. Through this gate, Galbatorix entered and stole a dragon hatchling. He and his new disciple hid themselves in an evil place where the riders dare not venture. There, Morzan entered into a dark apprenticeship, learning secrets and forbidden magic that should not have been revealed. When his instruction was finished and Galbatorix's black dragon, Shurikin, was fully grown, Galbatorix revealed himself to the world with Morzan at his side. Together, they fought any rider they met. With each kill, their strength grew. Twelve of the riders joined Galbatorix out of desire for power and revenged against their perceived wrongs. Those twelve, with Morzan, became the Thirteen Forsworn. The riders were unprepared and fell beneath the onslaught. The elves, too, fought bitterly against Galbatorix, but they were overthrown and forced to flee to their secret places, from whence they come no more. Only Vrail, leader of the riders, could resist Galbatorix and the Forsworn. Ancient and wise, he struggled to save what he could and keep the remaining dragons from falling to his enemies. In the last battle before the gates of Doru, 
Oreba, Vrail defeated Galbatorix, but hesitated with the final blow. Galbatorix seized the moment and smote him in the side. Grievously wounded, Vrail thread to the Utgard Mountains, where he had hoped to gather strength, but it was not to be, for Galbatorix found him. As they fought, Galbatorix kicked Vrail in the fork of his legs. With an underhanded blow, he gained dominance over Vrail and removed his head with a blazing sword. Then, as power rushed through his veins, Galbatorix anointed himself king over Alagazia, and from that day, he has ruled us. With the completion of this story, Brahm shuffled away in the, with the troubadours. Aragon thought he saw a tear shining on his cheek. People murmured quietly to each other as they departed. Garo said to Aragon and Rurin, Consider yourselves fortunate. I've only heard this tale twice in my life. If the Empire knew that Brahm had recited it, he would not live to see a new month.